Okay, uh, so uh, tonight I'm happy to announce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Rast Poyevtic. Uh, he's a doctoral student uh, here uh, uh, at the Department of Philosophy. Um, and uh, he's working uh, on uh, Descartes' uh, dualism. Uh, but today he's going to talk about something else, not unrelated, but something else. And... Uh, Gasko, uh, uh, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I will share my uh, presentation now. Uh, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Good. Yep. It's good. Uh, I'll go full screen and you mm -hmm. tell me if it works. <clears throat> it works? Yeah, it's all good. Okay. Thank, uh, f thank you for coming, and uh, I also want to thank John, Temple John Templeton Foundation and uh, the Energy Center uh, for helping us uh, in doing what we love, and obviously my project team as well. So, uh, my my uh, topic, my talk uh, is focused on, um, let's say. I I, be, I, uh, at, I I believe that it is. Uh, um, uh, an aspect of Descartes' philosophy that is not uh, explored enough, and this is teleology in Descartes' philosophy. And obviously, uh, I, I guess that usually people talk about teleology in Descartes as non-existent, um, but I think that the the actual reality, <laughs> textual rea reality, is more sub uh, subtle than that. And uh, I will um, explore some implications of Descartes' thesis in this context. So this is my own, um, pretty much my own uh, research. The structure of the talk is the following. For, uh, first, I will talk, uh, define teleology in general, and uh, afterwards I will uh, present Descartes' position on divine teleology uh, independently of the problematic context uh, which is the mind-body uh, relation. And afterwards, I will show how how his um, claims in the context of mind-body relation, uh, in the context of the theology of perception, uh, affect uh, or even make a contradiction uh, with these claims, with these independent claims about teleology. So uh, at first, I need to... I need to let me just hide this thumbnail. Okay. At first, uh, fir firstly, I need to define teleology, and I, this is just my own definition, but I, I don't think that it is controversial at all. So it is a branch of philosophy concerned with description, explanation, offense, or purposes. And I, I will use these terms synonymously in the talk. Uh, I don't make a, a distinction between purpose, a purpose and an end. So, uh, this is a little bit more complicated. This is uh, Simon's uh, scheme from her paper, uh, Sensible Ends, Latent Teleology in Descartes' Account of Sensation. It's an excellent paper. And uh, she makes a distinction between a natural, rational, and divine teleology. So I will use this scheme to support my argument, and therefore I need to explain it. Uh, first, uh, uh, it's natural teleology. What is natural teleology? She says that it is the attribution of ends to non-rational natural bodies and their parts. And I, I guess that from uh, a contemporary perspective, this is this is the most controversial kind of teleology, because with uh, let's say advancing advancement of science and especially biology, uh, and uh, by elimination of Aristotelian physics, this kind of teleology kind of um, uh, was eliminated as well. It, not kind of, it was eliminated as well. The infamous example of this is obviously the, these natural movements of uh, non-living things in Aristotelian physics, for instance, an explanation of the the fall of the rock, any fall of the of any rock, uh, but uh, the uh, rock falls down because it has its natural place underneath uh, the element of water and un underneath uh, element of fire and air. So at the center of the universe. So 
uh, it has a purpose, a natural purpose, uh, inherent purpose of moving towards its natural place. So the, this kind of teleology was used in physics, let's say, but uh, obviously n n people don't like to think about uh, things anymore in this way. On the other hand, rational teleology is not controversial at all, I think, not even today. So it is the attribution of ends to finite rational creatures engaging in conscious deliberative action. Not a problem at all. Everybody thinks that, um, I mean, we don't need to to talk about details of, the, of this definition, but we have some kind of interest, we have uh, some kind of aim, and we as human beings... Uh, uh, try to find a way to accomplish this, uh, this aim or this, this, so this telos. So uh, it's not a problem. And finally, divine teleology, which is, uh, which was controversial in Descartes' time, and it's controversial in our time as well. It's, it's the attribution. He must define it, defines it as a, the attribution of offense to God, and in particular to God's creative acts. And this uh, will um, this is the let's say uh, the kind of teleology which is most valuable valuable for my talk. So now that we that we fi we finished with teleology in general, we need to talk about uh, the, uh, Descartes' position on, on divine teleology. And uh, I think that. Uh, textual evidence that is Descartes claims in his biggest works, um, so meditations and principles and replies to objections, objections to meditations. All of these works corroborate, corroborate the the conclusion that uh, Descartes is a skeptic. Is a, he has a skeptical stance towards divine teleology? They are not capable of being known. And we cannot, therefore, we cannot uh, epistemically justify the ascription of ends purposes to or, or, or purposes to God. I will just show some parts of some of these texts. So, in the twenty-eighth um, paragraph of the first part of the principles, he says that we should never ex explain natural things uh, on the basis of the purposes of which God may have uh, had uh, in view when creating them. Uh, and even in the French version of the principles, uh, these diamond brackets uh, are, signify the French version. He says that we shall entirely banish from our philosophy the search for final causes. And uh, he has this expression uh, in the following sentence. He says that we should not be so arrogant as to suppose that we can share in God's plans. A little, a bit, little bit later, in the third part, in the second paragraph on principles, he 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 uh, puts forward a claim of, about our mental capacity. He says that our mental capacity is very mediocre in the French version, and uh, uh, afterwards he says he says that uh, we should not ever uh, suppose that the power of our minds can grasp the ends which he said before himself in, in creating the universe when talking about God. So in the principles, we have already two places in which he, he is skeptical towards divine teleology. And uh, in meditation four, he talks about his own uh, nature as a finite being in contrast to in the in infinity of God. He says that uh, the purposes of God are uh, impenetrable and that we should not search for final causes in physics. And probably the most interesting formulation and uh, the, the, the formulation that I will get back to afterwards is the, the following from the fifth replies. He says that from the function of the various parts of plants and animals uh, that, that, that we cannot guess from these functions what purpose God had in creating any given thing, even though we can admire God as, in, as their efficient cause. And he repeats the point. But uh, th this formulation is most interesting because of the, the this, uh, let's say, this mention of the function of the of, of, um, of organs of uh, plants and animal, animals. In other words, the, my point in this part of my talk is that divine teleology should be viewed as superstition in Descartes' opinion. Uh, 
my definition of superstition is uh, like on, on the basis of which definition I say this, it is a false belief about God or false religious belief. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, we could talk about this later, but this is kind of a cognitivistic definition, obviously, because it uses the notion of uh, be false belief and false belief in contrast to definitions we had before, which Dan mentioned uh, uh, in the def issue definitions of superstition as pathos or as, as emotion. So we have finished. <clears throat> We have finished uh, this part uh, about uh, Descartes' general view. There is no problem about this. Uh, he's skeptical towards divine teleology. But uh, there, I, I have found some suspicious passages uh, when reading about uh, his descriptions of sensory perceptions and uh, especially uh, this uh, body-to-mind uh, direction of causation when it comes to mind-body relation. So this passage may not be suspicious by itself, but it is suspicious uh, if we take, uh, uh, if we care about the background and if we ask a certain question, uh, which I will uh, present afterwards. So he, in this uh, in this passage, in uh, the uh, third paragraph of the second part of Principles, he explains that the, the the function of sensory perception is not to let's say represent metaphysical truth or to show what uh, what uh, to show the qualities of the world as it is uh, by itself uh, independently of us uh, or to show essential qualities of external things or what uh, pick any formulation so the, the, that is not the function of uh, sensory perception but the function is to show what is beneficial or harmful to man's composite nature. So to show what is good and, and bad in, uh, in man's surroundings, that, that, is, that is the function of sensory perception. So he repeats this, this point even uh, a year before he, he died. So the, he definitely thinks this, believes in this. But... Uh, what, where does the problem come in? Come in. The, the problem comes in uh, when when he's talking about uh, sensory perception in the in the sixth meditation, and he uses this this expression, the proper purpose of of the sensory perceptions given to me by my nature. So he's he's not talking only about function, uh, but he talks about the purpose. So this language uh, of of <laughs> This term purpose is more loaded, let's say, than function, metaphysically loaded. I, I guess I, I, I make that distinction, but but it's interesting nonetheless. So he, he changes the vocabulary, and I don't think that this is without reason. He 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 repeats the point about uh, the, the the representation of good and bad uh, in our surroundings uh, in relation to us as human beings, but he 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 talks about the proper purpose of the sensory perceptions. And a little bit later in the sixth meditation, when he uh, when he describes the uh, the body to mind direction of causation, that is when he describes sensory perception, he he says the following: My final observation is that any given movement occurring in a part of the brain that immediately affects the mind produces just one corresponding sensation, and hence the best system that could be devised is that it should produce the one sensation, the one sensation which of all possible sensations is most especially and most frequently conducive to the preservation of the healthy man. So he talks about the best system that could be planned, that could be um, ra rationalized, and it is the system in which there is a correspondence between one uh, one uh, position and, uh, of the pineal gland and uh, one sensation in the mind. So one mode of res extensa, and one mode of res cogitans. And <clears throat> this sensation which is produced is the sensation that uh, benefits the human being. And he, uh, afterwards, he claims that the experience shows that the sensation which nature has given us are all of this kind. And uh, he finishes with this um, um, claim about uh, admiration. On the basis of the, that, on the basis of this, we can admire God actually, and his 
uh, infinite wisdom and uh, his power and his goodness. So uh, what is the problem? When we ask, uh, why does sense perception have this purpose? Uh, why does uh, it has a, a purpose of informing the human being of good, bad, and the fling, things influence, influencing it? Uh, uh, why why does it, why does this happen? Uh, it I think it is fairly it is not really hard to see that we need to answer that this is uh, I, I I think that the answer comes from the domain of divine teleology that is in in other words. Uh, that God is the the entity which constitutes constitutes this relation and this quality or teleological quality of of uh, sensory perception. So this is my argument. Uh, where does this contradiction come come from? It comes from uh, on the one hand these independent theological view view that we had. Uh, at the start of my talk, and then uh, in this case we have, I think, something more, and this argument uh, will show that uh, that actually there is a contradiction. I hope that it will show. It is an argument by elimination. <clears throat> so the purpose or the end of sense perception either originates in a particular particular human being as a whole, a whole made of out of mind and body as two parts, two ontological parts. So or in something else. It cannot be the second premise says that it cannot be uh, it cannot originate in a hu uh, in human being as a whole. Therefore, it must originate something other than uh, the human being itself. And this uh, something, is the only other possible source is God. So the the the, uh, the conclusion is that the purpose or the end of sense perception orig originates in God. And uh, I think that. The the second uh, premise is the let's say the most uh, questionable one because I think that every other maybe the fourth I will talk about but every other is kind of um, trivial on on the background knowledge if we have the background knowledge of Descartes' ontology so let's justify the second premise. <clears throat> this purpose of sensory perception cannot originate in a human being as a whole. Uh, I I won't go into the de into details of of um, the kind the the kind of relation which is relation between mind and body, but uh, I will just say that there is some I I believe that there is some kind of sui generis relation between them, and uh, what is the problem? Why cannot this cannot this uh, sense uh, purpose originate uh, on? Uh, uh, be inherent, inherent uh, of human being. Why? Because there is no mention of uh, any kind of purpose of particular mind or a uh, particular human body. So uh, there is no mention of purpose, uh, purposefulness of parts. Therefore, there cannot be the uh, purposefulness, the, the purpose, the purposefulness of the whole. Uh, this is my argument. It's it's simple. So. It's it's about composition, yeah. But uh, I don't, I won't talk about any kind of uh, error of composition because uh, it's very simple. Uh, where does this uh, quality? Where does this uh, characteristic of tele tele theological quality comes in? Where does he, for, our first thought is that it can come from uh, parts, but there is um, there is no. Uh, tele teleology of either mind and body in, in, in Descartes' opinion by themselves. So <clears throat> a whole, uh, this is my key implicit premise, a whole cannot have a property if none of its parts has the same property. So if somebody said obviously that the other possibility is that they don't have the purpose by themselves, but they have a, uh, they have purpose on the basis of relation, between mind and body, this is okay, but I think that this already leads this is a non-starter. I mean, it's it's a good intuition, but it's a non-starter because it uh, leads us towards uh, divine teleology. It, it stops being this teleology of sense perception. Uh, if it is a, a relational property, it stops being a natural teleology and becomes divine teleology. Why? 
because the only entity that has uh, the, the legitimacy and the, and the power to put these two entities into relation is God. So this is this is true on the basis of of uh, of uh, the definition of substance. This is the definition of substance. It's it's God, God is an infinite substance. It depends on no other thing on, uh, for its existence. But uh, finite finite substances, uh, namely God, uh, namely mind and body, they depend only on God. And what this means, because uh, of De Descartes' view on uh, uh, the attribute uh, of substance, means that it, this means that. Uh, uh, if if something depend, depends on, solely on God for its existence, it auto, uh, automatically automatically depends for on God for its essential properties. Uh, this is I won't go into details why it's, why is this, but Descartes does not uh, talk about substance to it, uh, as this uh, substratum as something that ex can exist without any properties. So uh, the point is, the point is that. Uh, uh the point is that uh, there is no if if we talk about teleology of sensory perception as uh relational prop as a relational property it stops being a natural property it becomes uh, a, a, a divine property property that comes from god because the god is the only entity which can put mind and body into into this kind of relation into this kind of Sui generis relation. So finally, how is it possible to accept the knowledge of the teleology of sense perception, which can only be grounded in God's decision without accepting that God's purposes are known as well? And I just don't believe that it, this is possible. This is my point. If we know that the purpose or the end of sensory perception of human being of human being is health, well-being, or survival, and if we, we know that this purpose originates in God, then, then we know God's purpose as well. There, there is no possibility of uh, understanding of uh, sense perception, sensory per the teleology of sensory perception as uh, natural teleology. Obviously, nobody even thought that it could be a rational teleology. And therefore, uh, the only thing um, left, the only possibility left is that that the teleology of sense of perception is di uh, divine teleology. And uh, uh, the other way of formulating this is saying that uh, divine teleology is not superstition, at least part of it is not superstition, but genuine knowledge. We, I believe that we can, uh, that we must accept that if we know uh, some, some of the purposes of, like in the case of sensory perception, that we must know the uh, the purpose of God, which actually instituted this relation between body and mind. Uh, uh, finally, I want to finish with this. Uh, I think that uh, this contradiction that Descartes uh, uh, falls into, let's say, uh, that that uh, it comes from this uh, this uh, part uh, I already quoted from the fifth replies. So <clears throat> he says that we cannot guess uh, uh, from the function of the various parts of plants and animals uh, to, to that we cannot guess uh, what purpose God had in mind in, in creating any given thing. But I, I believe that precisely in the case of human being, he not, he not only guesses, but he talks about the best system that could be devised. So uh, if, if we didn't accept uh, this this kind of explanation from the sixth meditation about body to mind uh, relation, this explanation that is based on teleology, we need to actually uh, throw out the window the the explanation of my, uh, mind and body relation. It, it's a really it's a it's too big of a cost. We we cannot we cannot uh, do this. I mean, Descartes, Descartes. I don't believe that he would like to do this. Uh, and to 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 let's say strengthen my point, I, I want to finish with the analogy with the craftsman. So <clears throat> uh, I I, com I compare this situation 
um, between uh, God and a human being and teleology of sen sensory perception as, as a function, as a, a capacity of human being. I compare this situation to a situation uh, between a, craft, a craftsman and an artifact. So I, I ask the following question, and I, I rhetorically I ask, uh, if we know a, a purpose of an artifact, if we know a purpose, uh, or let's say, of a car, for it to be a transport vehicle or whatever, um, of a knife that it should be, it should uh, cut through things. Uh, uh, don't we know the purpose of the maker that is of a being who made that artifact? Uh, it's these two things are so closely related. We cannot know one without the other. Uh, when bec why? Because actually the the purpose, ontologically speaking, the purpose of the artifact is a consequence of the purpose that. Uh, that uh, the maker of the artifact ha has while planning, while devising this this artifact, this product. So it's I think it's uh, it's an important analogy between God and a human being and uh, crafts and and an art artifact. Obviously, there are limits to this anal analogy, but the point is how can we know a function of uh, an artifact without knowing. A, uh, a purpose of of the maker of the artifact it's it, it's impossible uh we obviously the the good part of the analogy is that we can know the purpose of the artifact the purpose of the maker but that does not mean that we know anything else about the maker or even the important uh, purposes about the maker we we may not know this it's not important but we know enough for it, for uh, for divine teleology, not to be superstition, uh, completely. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rasko. Uh, and uh, um, I'm wondering if uh, Anastasia or uh, Bogdan uh, or, uh, or or Peter uh, have any questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and... Just a second. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know mm -hmm. how to make my. Uh, okay, now I see. Yeah, okay. I see. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, should I talk in English? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you, Raska. It was a great uh, lecture, and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think Peter needed to accept me in the in the room in the meeting room i think three times <laughs> because i was in the bus and i was disconnecting um okay so um this analogy in the end um how because it is pretty similar to what aristotle says about the um the, the teleology of the things and the creator and everything so in in what sense <laughs> Well, <laughs> okay. uh, so in what sense uh, is this analogy similar to Aristotle's view and um, in what not and what are the differences? Thank, thank you for the question. But can you elaborate on the details of Aristotle's claim? Because I mean, I, I don't know enough in order to I don't know the details. I, I have heard of this, but uh, I'm not sure if I could compare it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, my point is on the fact uh, that when we talk about Aristotle and when we talk about causation, then we have this uh, idea and we have this maker who is, I think the famous example is with the uh, statue. When someone um, uh, makes it, he puts the idea, with, which is some kind of the essence sort of to say about what it is the meaning and what is the telos of this statue and uh he makes it and he gives it the meaning so that is uh like the the form of position there and then um i don't know in what sense we can talk about this when we talk about uh human beings not human beings but living beings in general when we talk about uh his uh 
uh, idea about species and about uh, uh, um, the kinds and everything. So in that sense, we also have some kind of essence that um, is um, that underlies the whole this whole sequence of of beings. So uh, if we have this parallel, what are then what are the similarities and what are the differences in these two? Approaches. Uh, thank you for the orientation. I mean, now I actually know precisely what I want to say. So, obviously, uh, the controversial point in Descartes' um, of philosophy and in its in in the scholarship is that the question of uh, substantial forms and uh, the re residual, let's say, uh, the framework of Aristot Aristotle in in Descartes' philosophy. So. <clears throat> Uh, the I believe that um, the that the the notion of substantial form, which is obviously the carrier of these um, purpose of it's 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 the mark of the species. Obviously, it's what constitutes uh, uh, this uh, uh, the nature of, of a thing and what uh, on the basis of this quality uh, the the thing uh, is uh, not a part of the species but it belongs to a species uh, and and it, on the basis of this quality it has a certain purpose so it, uh, in i i believe that in in general in especially in physics in the in, in the wide sense uh, Descartes eliminates this notion, and he does not use it. But when we read uh, the correspondence, and when we read uh, the, it, it this this I think it shows this notion of the term substantial, the, not even substantial, but the term form. I think shows up once, uh, once in principles or two times, and once in uh, the discourse on, on on the method, and that's it. But uh, if we actually, so he does not want to use this terminology. But if we actually uh, think about the function of the of of um, the mind or the soul in relation to body, it has some properties which which uh, actually uh, uh, would uh, Aristotelian form have. For instance. It, 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 you could say that it gives unity, maybe, or identity, a, a particular human soul to a particular human body. Without it, we don't have a, a human body. We just have uh, res extensa in general. So when when after that, there is no human body. Let's say there is that that kind of thinking. Obviously, Paul Hoffman is the one who pioneered this uh, this work uh, on the soul uh, on the soul uh, as as uh, substantial form. And he tries to rehabilitate this notion, but the, I think that the, the main uh, difference in this case is that we cannot find uh, the purpose that is the telos of sensory perception uh, in the human being itself. So uh, that that is the difference in comparison to Aristotle. In Aristotle, the substantial form is the does all, all of these three functions I already mentioned, and in in Descartes. The, the this sensory perception must actually somehow be uh, uh, be generated from the relation and the relation must be really uh, instituted by God there is no other way because uh, both mind and body are substances so I think that it is kind of weird because um, this uh, functionality is actually external to bo both parts in 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 that's uh, that's a big different the big difference in in comparison to Aristotle um I think I think that that is the I, I I'll think of something else I guess but this is the main thing thank you thank you thank you okay uh you uh Anastasia uh anybody else oh uh is there uh uh uh, oh, Peter, uh, would you like to to ask or comment? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Rasko, for this uh, great talk. Uh, it was really interesting, especially for me, because I don't know 
much about Descartes, and it's always a pleasure to hear from you about him. Um, but on the other hand, I'm a really big fan of teleology, uh, especially teleosemantics, but that doesn't matter. I like teleology. I like teleology in biology and in every other science or uh, every other part of, of my life. Um, and it's interesting for me um, with um, dominance of uh, uh, evolutionary view of um, uh, everything, uh, uh, teleology became functionalism. And if you are talking about teleology, uh, you don't really talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, categories like proper or improper or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, true, false, and so on. But when you talk about functions, they can be uh, proper, improper, and so on. And uh, uh, I don't want to ask you anything about uh, Descartes, but I want to ask you something about teleology. Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so superstition uh, can be viewed as uh, 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 something that is not uh, 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 functioning properly. Uh, but on the other hand, I really think that uh, in teleological aspects, I like the, the historical view. Um, we have a trait uh, and we have a, a history uh, uh, of that trait. Uh, we can track that trait uh, uh, to the point where that trait was selected for something. And uh, uh, by, by that selection, uh, that trait has its own purpose or its own function. And I think the superstition, I'm also a really big, big fan of conspiracy theories and superstition and all kinds of mistakes. I like mistakes. Um, and I think superstition is actually a, a, a function that works properly, but uh, there is no uh, a historical surrounding uh, that can correspond to why the trait was selected. And we have different surrounding, uh, dif different environments, but superstition, uh, I think it's uh, a proper functioning uh, uh, and it's really good for us. Like uh, I can be superstitious about uh, all kinds of things and I can be aware uh, of that's uh, superstition, but it's okay for me. I would like uh, uh, that superstition to be a part of my culture, uh, to be like a ritual or something, because I think uh, collectively it's good for us. Um, it's good to, I don't know, put our hand on the stove a um, few many times and so on. And uh, I think it's good for me to refresh my screen all the time, although I don't need it. Okay, that's not superstition, but it's um, similar in cognitive sense. Uh, it can be, superstition can be really, uh, uh, can, be, can, can help us uh, deal with all kinds of uh, uh, dangerous sensation in our environment and so on. So, I'm a fan of superstition, I'm a fan of teleology, and I would like to uh, hear from you, what do you think about superstition in general uh, regarding teleology and regarding proper functioning and so on? Thank you for your comment and for the question. I mean, it's a really fun question. I believe that, uh, I mean, you said a lot, but uh, concerning this proper functioning of superstition, Obviously, in my talk, I use this kind of cognitivistic definition, but I I, I don't really even like uh, this to put too big of a gap between cognition and emotion. I think that's a big mistake. So in the case of, let's say, some kind of uh, popular view, popular supersti superstitions, especially uh, those which actually kind of um, organically came from community in which they... Uh, are practiced and not these superstitions that came from Edgar Allan Poe or whatever. So, I mean, uh, if we went even before, before uh, even uh, earlier into history, I guess that uh, there is there is a legitimate uh, kind of uh, psychological uh, function to uh, uh, that superstition actually accomplishes. 
And I, I, I would define this as some kind of, um, uh, I mean, this could be defined in many ways, but uh, if somebody does this, just like in rituals, so if somebody does this ritual, this procedure, he and he is not, actually does not care really about the truth, metaphysical truth of the world. He does not care about how things actually are, whatever. He he does not have this dimension of this perspective, but he only thinks that this should be done, that this is true uh, on the basis of this collective opinion, and he does this. There is some kind of relief, let's say, of frustration, or this some kind of emotional relief. It, there is a, some kind of psychological function that is actually... Uh, accomplished by doing this ritual. Um, the popular example is, for instance, Milan Tarot. So is he a charlatan or he actually helps somebody? This is a real good, really good question, I think, because uh, people need to believe that they will eliminate the, their frustration, their unhappiness or whatever if they do something. But this, this the, the real cause of, the true cause of this frustration, of this unhappiness is a lot deeper and they need some kind of remedy that will actually help them uh, in, let's say, short, in a sh short-term remedy. They need this. So I guess that superstitions can actually have this psychological pur uh, uh, purposeful, purposefulness, and therefore they, it can be adequate. But I'm talking, I'm talking about this from a strictly theoretical perspective because I have a feeling that I, 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 the superstition cannot do this for me. I'm already a distance from this i'm already i cannot believe this but if somebody is not let's say developed enough uh, whatever this means intellectually they can actually maybe accomplish something by superstition and then the, may, um, this 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 obviously could work in the context of uh you know pre um, societies that uh, existed before in in history when uh, there wasn't really a clear clear cut between true religion and false religion, which is a false religious belief, which is superstition, but it was all interconnected, I guess. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a just quick comment, if I may. Okay. Uh, yeah. While you were talking, I, I thought, I, th uh, I was thinking about divine teleology and uh, like we have Immanuel Kant and we have Alvin Plantinga. Uh, Immanuel Kant says you have to suppose something unconditioned, you know, the, our mind is like that. There is something beyond that is unconditioned and uh, we have to suppose that. Uh, and Alvin Plantinga, on the other hand, sa says uh, atheist, if, if you don't believe in God, your cognitive functions are not working properly. Uh, and if we go back to Kant, uh, that's because you didn't suppose something that is unconditioned. Um, and that was my, my comment. I, I, Plantica was always uh, uh, really fun uh, uh, while reading it. And uh, it, it's really, really fun to, to hear, you know, if you don't believe in God, your cognitive functions are not working properly. But also, uh, I think that he thinks about that Kantian defect, you know, you don't believe in something unconditioned and it's kind of impossible uh, for human mind to do so. I don't agree, but that was my comment. Maybe Plantinga would be interesting to you uh, regarding this divine teleology aspect. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, I have uh, a comment and uh, rather suggestion. Uh, uh, the thing is that uh, it would be uh, probably interesting to see, like, besides this logical structure of the argument, uh, you presented really well, very interesting, um, to see uh, uh, what was going on with the cards between uh, meditations and principles uh, uh, and, uh, and the later uh, stages. Uh, uh, that uh, where he uh, uh, said that it was uh, uh, that we cannot really know uh, the purposes uh, and what he, uh, whether these two are uh, maybe he gave up the idea uh, in the meantime I'm just asking so uh, from the perspective 
people of his own life, people change uh, their minds, right? So maybe he wrote meditations and principles and then left that behind and then uh, uh, thought further uh, about purposes and realized we cannot know that maybe like he takes his mind in the meantime. It would be nice to see uh, the, the, uh, the argument presented within that context and just to kind of explore whether uh, that's possible. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, like, uh, when you uh, read some of his exchanges with his contemporaries, uh, I think uh, like, uh, in, uh, now uh, I, I will find the, the, the note uh, 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 later. Uh, he replied to one of the objections uh, uh, presented to him that uh, the, the objection was, uh, and what about meditations? And he says, like, ah, that's for reading the one. We move on and now explore the causes in nature. Like, it's just for you to kind of engage in that kind of um, uh, metaphysics once in your lifetime. But then you just move on and do what really is at stake here and it's the study of nature and so on. So I'll, I'll give you the footnote. I read it somewhere and I cannot remember the name. But uh, maybe it would be interesting to kind of put the, the timeline and see uh, what was happening uh, uh, with his thoughts and whether he changed his mind or not in the meantime. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. But it's, it seems to me that, I, I, I'm I not sure, but it seems to me that he that did not really change his opinion in, in uh, about the general divine teleology, but that uh, when it comes to explaining the mind-body relation, that he, he is, there is a really great tension uh, between this explanation. I mean, I guess that uh, the explanation of this, this part of the sixth meditation in which uh, he writes that the best system that could be devised and uh, he explains that the relation between body and mind is some kind of there is a there is a like this teleological constituent so the type of sensation we, we have is actually based on the let's say value of the thing that we perceive so if it's good or bad uh, and this this is also mentioned in the in uh, Passions of the Soul, obviously. So the la his last published work and he, the work he 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 was writing at uh, at the end of his life. So I I just it's I don't think that he changed his opinion, but mm -hmm. it there is a really great tension when it comes to explaining these uh, relations bet between substances. So uh, this is the I mean how how to evade how to evade this. Um, uh, how to evade the conclusion that we actually know God's purposes on if we know uh, the uh, how, uh, how is um, uh, if we know the way in which mind and body uh, influence each other that that is I think the point I think that when he del delves into more into this explanation of mind body relation then he actually uh, runs into a contradiction to, uh, he he must he but he didn't probably revise his general view on tele divine teleology. Maybe he would. I don't know. But yeah. the, I think that Descartes, um, there is this. Uh, uh, go, go, go. Please say. What did you want? Can you hear me? Uh, uh, I, it was, uh, I, I, yeah, I do. Uh, I just missed some of what you said, but I agree. Maybe he didn't change his mind, uh, and that uh, that would be interesting to kind of state. Uh, 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 but there is another thing that he might have uh, uh, haven't done actually, and that to uh, may find distinctions between purposes. Maybe he had in mind when he said that we cannot infer purposes, uh, God's purposes. Uh, maybe he had in mind purposes of uh, the human being, purposes of the created world, and uh, and this is really a specific kind of purpose. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, that's the function of human. So, so maybe maybe he had in mind the first and not the latter. But again, uh, he definitely has in mind uh, this kind of. I, I know the term the the best term if if the best term for this, but let's say in the grand scheme of things, what is the purpose of a particular being? So. 
the purpose mm -hmm. of sensory perception is not that kind of purpose you know so what uh, what is the purpose of a particular you know um, what is the purpose of napoleon let's say if he started thinking about the whole of human history the what is the purpose of uh, this or that battle what is the purpose of a certain uh, societal system whatever if he, uh, he he usually thinks I'm, I'm about these great purposes that i think the the absolute purposes of things and so he, he he i guess that all of his claims are actually um are actually directed towards these kinds and not this like a small 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 purpose of like a, a capacity of a, of a certain being yeah 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 or survival of the human being. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, okay. Yeah. If we don't have any more questions, uh, I would like to thank uh, Rasko for uh, informative and uh, interesting talk. And uh, well, uh, I'll see you uh, in a couple of. We'll we'll see each other in in a couple of weeks uh, when our next speaker is. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for coming.